Embark on a culinary adventure at Adams Morgan Eats in the Streets on Saturday, July 29th. That's from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. The event will take place during the launch of the 2023 Adams Morgan Pedestrian Zone. That's the 2300 and 2400 blocks of 18th Street Northwest. Eats in the Streets will showcase approximately 50 neighborhood restaurants and retailers where attendees can sample cuisines from across the globe, purchase meals to go, and enjoy free, free entertainment, including live musical performances. The event is brought to you by the Adams Morgan Partnership Bid and sponsored by Aetna. More information can be found at admodc.org slash eats. That's A-D-M-O-D-C dot org slash eats. Today on CityCast DC, Tom Sietzema has spent a career eating his way through town as the Washington Post's restaurant critic. He will not tell us the secret name he uses when he makes anonymous reservations, but he is here to let us in on some of his other secrets. So get ready to hear why it's important to check out a restaurant bathroom, to learn what Tom's worst DC dining experience was, and to find out why brunch is for suckers. Today is Thursday, July 27th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Tom Sietzema, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. So uh, you wrote this piece about a week in your life. You have one of those jobs in Washington, food critic, that people are uh, intensely curious about what it's like to be one. What do you think is the best thing about being a restaurant critic in D.C.? You know, I am lucky to have sort of a front row seat to all sorts of trends. I think first and foremost, I feel like a cheerleader for diners, and I love that. And I love the relationship that I have with diners and readers of the Washington Post. I mean, that is always key for me. I don't feel like I'm a cheerleader for the industry. I'm looking out for people who are spending their hard-earned money, hopefully. But I, I do feel, I pinch myself, even these many years later, I've been in this job since 2000, I, I pinch myself every day. I, I'm, I'm lucky to have a job uh, that I'm paid to do. That It's basically my hobby. You know, I've always been interested in food and cooking and restaurants. And I used to save up my money before I was doing this professionally to uh, see what was going on in restaurants uh, with my predecessor and others around the country. And uh, I just feel grateful to, to have a job that uh, allows me to be out and about and document this uh, for readers of the Washington Post. So at the risk of, of sounding yokelish, um, how do you think our food scene in, in uh, the DMV compares to other cities? You know, thanks for asking. Uh, in 2015, I had the great opportunity to travel around the country for a year and rate the top 10 food cities. I spent at least a week in 12 cities and came up with a top 10 list. Portland, Oregon was number one. And I was looking not just at restaurants, but also at bars and farm markets and grocery stores and agriculture, all of that. And at the time, Washington came in at number nine. Again, this was in 2015. What's stronger here than other places and what's weaker here than other places? Well, I think, you know, as a world capital, I think we have a little bit of everything here. I mean, we might be missing real deli uh, as one gets in, in New York. But I think pretty much every other part of the globe is very well represented in Washington. Maybe not in the numbers that you get in, say, Los Angeles or New York, but we're quite a bit smaller than those markets. I will say, I do feel like our food scene is really exciting. And I think if you care about fine dining, uh, which is one aspect of what I cover, there's no place better than Washington to do that. I think we're really on the cutting edge, um, not in, in terms of old guard French or Italian restaurants, but hip, new, fun, sexy places to spend a lot of money and eat really well. So you wrote that the kind of default question a stranger might ask you when they meet you is, what's your favorite D.C. restaurant? Let me uh, subvert that. What was your worst D.C. restaurant experience? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I always tell people I eat bad food so you don't have to, right? That's <laughs> that's part of the job. I have had lots of lesser meals, I think, in the course of doing this job. Probably the place that readers might remember the most was... Uh, a number of years ago, I reviewed um, Founding Farmers 
in Foggy Bottom and gave it zero stars. And this was after going there seven or eight times. So I felt like I really did due diligence. I went by myself. I went with groups of people. I went when it was slower on a Monday, when, when it was busy on a Saturday, I went for lunch and dinner and back. And um, I just felt like it was more farm to fable than farm to table. <laughs> you know, a lot of readers uh, disagreed with me. A lot of people, you know, it was sort of half and half. It was one of these things. But that was probably the worst dining experience that I've had in the last decade or so. So you panned them and then what happened? I mean, there was a time when the lead restaurant critic of the daily newspaper could probably get a place shut down with a harsh review. Is that still true? People have so many other options. I think it depends upon the restaurant and the critic and what is actually written about that restaurant. In the in the case of, you know, there are some restaurants that are just critic proof. I look at places like Cafe Milano in Georgetown. I just ate there. You know, I, I take the pulse of a lot of restaurants that are fairly popular, people are curious about, and Cafe Milano is certainly one of those. And I went back recently, and yeah, the pizza's still not really good, and the lobster in the pasta was overcooked. And I felt like I was crashing a private party, like I did not belong. The draw there, I think, is not so much the food, but the fact that Democrats and Republicans and every persuasion can sort of find a place there, especially if you're famous, especially if you're the, with the administration. Bad food for bad people. Bad. <laughs> you said it, I didn't. <laughs> so wait, how, you said you were to Founding Farmers seven or eight times. How many times do you usually go in, in order to feel like you've been fair? I, I, I typically go at least three times. I think that's fair because, you know, restaurants are living beings, you know, I and, and three visits, uh, multiple visits gives me the opportunity to sit in different parts of the restaurant, to reorder dishes. You know, is the chicken always that dry? Is it always that juicy? to get different servers. And I think one of the reasons most uh, publications go back multiple times is because, you know, unlike a book reviewer, film reviewer, the author or the director can't change the ending necessarily for individual critics. But a lot of things can happen if a known critic is in a restaurant to sort of make things better for that critic. And over the years, I, you, you just develop, you know, the fact that people are overly friendly or something like that. I'd pay attention to what's going on, not always at my table so much, but at surrounding tables. I'll walk through the restaurant to see if people are trying to flag down a waiter for a check or if, if it looks like their tables aren't cleared and, and that sort of thing. I also have little tricks. I sometimes show up late and I my party will have been seated already so that it, the appetizer is on its way and they have no idea that the critic from the Washington Post is coming and is going to sit down to that, right? So there are ways of getting around, you know, the fact that after all these years and with social media and cameras and all that, it's harder and harder to go in as an unknown entity anymore. But I have uh, I have some little trade secrets that help me toward that end. But it sounds like you you figure that anybody who really wants to make it their business is going to figure out what you look like. Well, I certainly would. If I was a restaurant owner, I would uh, identify people that you eat with, as restaurants have done, and um, find out what your tastes are, what you like to, you know, just by writing, people know that I like booths rather than tables, <laughs> you know, and I like red wine to be a little chilled. Uh, people will sometimes comment on that too when they're bringing it over the table. Oh, we just chilled this red wine. Okay, well, thank you very much. Just, just do it for everybody else, you know. Is there a way you can tell if you've been made? Oh, sure. Yeah. People will parade by your table, like the bus boys or the waiters. All of a sudden, you, you have this sense that people are looking at you, you know. I've, I, I have to change the names that I use for my reservations with more frequency now because word gets out. I know that people pass my pseudonyms along to, uh, to fellow restaurants. I've used burner phones before. I call from friends' phones to make reservations. I have probably 15 resi and open table accounts. I have different names on different credit cards. I won't ask for any of your current pseudonyms, but do you have a favorite retired pseudonym? I do. It was I Don Cook. <laughs> I period Don Cook. Mr. Cook. If you say it real fast, it's like, I don't cook. That's pretty stupid, I realize, but like, I thought it was pretty clever 12 years ago. And just for the record, you are a, a four foot three inch blonde man with a ponytail. I yes. love it. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
So look, you obviously you eat a ton every day. Like, how do you stay hungry for it all? And I mean, like, literally, how do you stay hungry for it all? Is someone going to suffer because you happen to show up late and you've already had a big lunch? You know, that that's such a good question. I try not to eat a full meal. And I think the restaurant critic diet is a pretty good diet because when I go out with groups of people, we'll, we'll trade plates. And everyone at that table, say I go out with four people, people will not eat half of it because they know three other people are going to be eating off that dish too. And then two, not all food is, is delicious. So unless something is truly delicious, I don't finish it. And I've been known to salt desserts so that I don't mindlessly keep eating the ice cream or the lemon tart or whatever is in front of me as we're winding down the evening. So salt, you mean like literally you'll put salt on top of them in order to... I have been known to do that. Yeah, just so I stop eating it. But then unfortunately, <laughs> people forget that I have done that. <laughs> and they, yeah, people across the table uh, dig in and like, wow, this dessert is salty. Do you like take a doggy bag when you leave? I am from the Midwest. I'm a big believer in not wasting things. And if I don't take it home, I, I oftentimes send it home with friends or dining companions I'm with. Just don't take the man's dessert. Don't take the man's dessert. In your diary of the week, you mentioned how you love to eat with a variety of people. You sometimes call friends from embassies to Uh experience food of a specific culture. Sure. I'm curious, who's the ideal person to share a meal with? The ideal person is not a food person. I would rather talk about anything other than food at the table. I think it all depends upon the restaurant. You know, I love to experience like a high-end restaurant through the eyes of someone who would never be able to afford that, like a a college student or a a, a young family, a young couple just starting out. I like someone who um, has very few allergies, uh, no dietary restrictions. I like people who are good conversationalists. I appreciate uh, learning. Yeah, I, I feel like it's a masterclass for me sometimes. I get to eat out with lawyers or people from the White House or people who have spent a significant time abroad, you know. So those are the kinds of discussions we have. Um, it's not usually talking about the food. That's my job is to remember the funny thing the waiter said, every sauce that goes past me on the rotation, that sort of thing. One thing in your um, diary that I thought was interesting was you inspect the restroom every time you go to a restaurant. What does that reveal? Well, I do that for a couple of reasons. I think uh, cleanliness is really important. It's one of those things that a lot of readers care about. But also, um, in the last year or so, I've added accessibility to my restaurant reviews. And so I want to know whether people in wheelchairs can access the restroom. And so I do it for several reasons. One, for like a cleanliness, attention to detail matter, and the other for um, to see if people in wheelchairs can get into the uh, restroom. How much of an issue is accessibility? I mean, how are DC restaurants in general on that measure? Well, I think newer restaurants have to be accessible. But I think with older places, sometimes historic places, their uh, restrooms have been grandfathered in and it's so expensive to put in elevators and all, all sorts of things like that, that some restaurants still aren't as welcoming to people with uh, disabilities. I don't know if I want to hear the full answer to this, but do you have a, a best and worst uh, bathroom memory? <laughs> I don't offhand. I will say that just because you're an expensive venue doesn't mean your restrooms are any cleaner than those you might find in, say, a, a dive. Well, right. And we've we've also changed our aesthetics some so that some of the most highbrow and priciest places, you know, it's not the days when you had like a bathroom attendant who will hand you a napkin. Sure. They've kind of aestheticized a degree of grunge too, in some cases. Sure. You mentioned it's important that you take the pulse of the neighborhood where you're eating. Tough decision, but what do you think is the best uh, restaurant neighborhood in DC or the or the environs? Oh, right now, I, I think the hill has improved quite a bit. You know, it used to be a little bit... Um, Sort of B grade, I guess, but there are some great watering holes up there. I love the the duck and the peach. The old standbys, of course, like Market Lunch, uh, have been there forever. But I like the fact that you can drink and eat so much better on the hill. There's Rose's Luxury up there and Pineapple and Pearls, uh, sibling restaurants. 
you can eat very well on the hill. I, I think that is probably most improved. Georgetown's gotten a lot better too. Places that I'm most drawn to might be in Shaw and um, who else? No, the burbs have gotten really good. I have to say, there's plenty of reasons for people in Alexandria and Tyson's Corner and Bethesda uh, to stay home and eat close, eat nearby. Dramatic thing in your diary that you revealed is you hate brunch, or at least you're not a big fan. Can you explain that? Yeah, I think a lot of critics don't like brunch because it's sort of this um, meal that sort of happens in the middle of the day and there's usually alcohol and sometimes too much of it involved and you just want to go home and take a nap. It sort of ends up being a lost day if you're drinking at like one o'clock. It's like day drinking and eating fatty food and, and all of this. I also feel like it's generally the, the B team cooking then, you know, because the A team is cooked on Friday and Saturday night and they need to a, a day off. And so you might not be getting the best food and you might be drinking a little bit more than you would at that time of day, typically. I remember once proposing a feature that would be like, where chefs eat. And okay. my colleagues who wrote about restaurants were like, no, that's a really stupid idea because chefs are freaks. They work until 11, 12, one in the morning. They go out to a place where their friend might be serving because like nothing else is open. Sure. These are not people with a sort of normal life whose uh, choices can affect you. But you all, as as food critics, ha are a little bit freaks too. I mean, in the sense that you, you, you live an unusual culinary life. How do you keep yourself grounded with how your readers are going to want to eat? How do I keep myself grounded? I think I keep myself grounded uh, by being careful about who I eat out with. Again, I like to eat out with people who aren't me, um, who come from different economic and uh, other backgrounds, who might not be white, who might not be male. I think that's important to keep me grounded in terms of what might surprise readers or what might tickle readers or what might turn readers off. I also think it's really important to, to, to cook a little bit at home too. And so I have uh, dinner parties every six weeks or so. I think it's important, you know, if you care about food and, and you want to know how things are made. And, and I, I think it's important for critics to get their hands a little dirty and, and go shopping and, and cook at home and appreciate the labor and the time, and the thought that goes into a carefully made meal. Did, did my invitation to that dinner party get lost in the mail? What happened? Oh, uh -huh. you're next, Michael. <laughs> As you know, you know, we've had huge changes in media. If I wanted to go you know, figure out where to go eat tonight, I'd go online and uh -huh. I might get you a professional and very conscientious restaurant critic, or I might get like Joe2257 on Yelp. Is there a future for someone who's starting out now in journalism and wants to make being a, a restaurant critic their career? And if so, what should they do? Sure. I started in the Pleistocene era and, and, and the deal then was you, you either started a big newspaper and then you go small and get ever better jobs. Uh, you work your way around the country as I did. You know, I was my predecessor's assistant for three years. So I learned how to cook. I learned what a good story was, that sort of thing. But I left being someone's assistant at the Washington Post and became the food editor at the Milwaukee Journal, right? And, and now, like, a, a lot of newspapers don't have restaurant critics anymore, right? So my thing is, if I was starting out today, um, you, you need to write. You, like, I would start a blog. I would just start writing a newsletter, whatever it is. Get a little following. Hey, reach out to people you trust to edit your work, whether that's a, a college professor or someone who is just really good with words. Or I get stuff unsolicited all the time from people. Hey, would you read this? I got a batch of reviews from fourth graders last week. And it was utterly charming. A school teacher from... Fairfax sent me a batch of reviews from her students. And so it's never, to, but, but, but the thing is, if you start out, you can't just say, oh, I love food and I love to eat out. Well, a lot of people like to do that. You have to have something to point to when people ask, well, how do you know about food or what do you know? Or how do you know how to write? And I also think it's really important, you know, write about your passion. Is it barbecue? Is it coffee? Is it Thai food? Is it, you know, whatever, and become an expert in that. So anytime people will have a question about that or an interest in that cuisine or that cooking style, whatever it is, um, they will come to you for that. 
Tom Sietzema, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Michael. This is great. Before you go, here is some quick news. Brace yourselves. DC is headed towards a heat wave. The next couple of days are expected to have temperatures that feel well into the triple digits. DC has activated a heat emergency plan, which includes opening cooling centers around the city. And also, Virginia's school sports authority is defying statewide guidelines by continuing to allow transgender students to be on sports teams that match their gender identity. The policy will, however, require student athletes who have transitioned to provide extensive documentation, receive signatures from the principal and a parent, and be reviewed by a committee. And that's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, tell your brunch companions about it and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye.